Hello, everybody. We are here with The Real 50 Over 50, and I would love to introduce you to Angela Todd. Um, Angela, will you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and what you do and the impact that you make in the world? I'd be delighted. Thanks for having me, Donna. My name is Angela L. Todd. I worked for 18 years as a, an archivist and a senior research scholar at a science archive at a fancy university. And I am very excited to be out on my own to concentrate on adding women and historically excluded populations to the archives. We know that women make up half the population. Women do not make up half of history. And in that space, population, history, there's a gap and that's the archives. When historians go to write books and papers and articles, they go to the archives. So I'm on a mission to encourage women to insist on their own inclusion in the archives. And this is one of the reasons I wanted Angela to share what she does because it is so critically important. And um, one one of the things that I, I, I'm going to take her through a series of prompts because I want to make sure that she um, tells everybody why this is so important. I want you all to leave this interview with a different viewpoint of your own personal story and the impact that it has, not only within your life, your family, your community, but the world and the future. I mean, it's so critical. And we don't see this because we're busy going, to, uh, going, to, going about our day. But the first thing that I want you to kind of describe so people understand what the difference is, is what is the difference between, um, between genealogy and a person's personal history? Ooh, this is a good question. Um, <clears throat> I love genealogy. I have a big project of my own going. But the genealogy machine consists primarily of institutional records that are saved by somebody else, churches, governments, schools. And an archive are the documents you save. So I call it the real people's history. Census records are great and they can tell us a lot but they can't tell us everything. And it's so imperative that we keep track of ourselves and mark how we've gone through this world. Donna and I were talking before the call about, I'm a strong believer in family of choice. And so those people are not gonna be included in your genealogical surveys, right? So the people you're, you know, we have an Aunt Mary who's not really related and she yeah. needs to be documented by me. Yes. Not, you know, Ancestry.com is never going to find her. Um, and those people have been important to my kids. And I know your kids too, Donna, or your son. Yeah. And, and there's and no even other way up, to find them. We, we had Aunt E and Aunt Miriam. They were not our family. Yeah. And I think it's so common, but in family history, it kind of evaporates because yeah. family still means those real ties that are documented by church and state and other kinds of records. And so we were also talking about I have moved back to Maine after 30 years in Pittsburgh. And uh, one of my parents had a mate for 25 years, but they never married. But the kids were all raised together. So we had this great coffee date and, you know, talked for hours, catching up really intimately. And I came home and said to my kids, oh, I had the best time with my stepsister. And they were, <laughs> gave me the look like, mom's full of surprises. What the hell? Stepsister? What are you talking about? <laughs> but we decided to go. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but we decided to call each other stepsister because that was you know, we spent 25 years together. Yeah, so totally. There's a way in which we really need to narrate our own stories. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to move on to the next thing. Um, um, talk a little bit about oral history and why that is important. There are so many reasons. So oral history, first of all, the sound of somebody's voice 
can tell you when they're joking or being sarcastic or it's not really a fact, it's a joke. So that's one important thing. I have a, um, a client who we interviewed her mom and she said, please get mom to sing happy birthday. And I did, and we saved it. And she plays it every year on their birthdays. So mom's going to stay with them throughout. There's a great, you know, laugh in the family. There's a great limerick in the family. I've had people uh, recite limericks. One guy sang in Yiddish. Another woman hired me to interview her dad, and he sang uh, church hymns in French. And the whole family was stunned that he knew French. <laughs> So there's a lot that can be revealed. And sometimes what gets revealed might not check out in uh, terms of fact checking. And when that happens, I don't think that's a problem. I think that is a mystery to research a little bit, but it'll tell you why, okay, this group at the church can hang out with this group or the sisters stop talking to each other or you know, the way the family unfolded has a lot to do with how they were perceived by this person or whatever it is. I've also done an oral history about, oh, there was a rumor about that house being part of the Underground Railroad and it turned out to be. So those pieces of information have different levels of use, right? And that's so really now, the only... Sorry, that's really also the only way to tell the story about like my stepsister or meeting your birth mother or things that there's no paperwork for. Like you can't even really save the papers about meeting your birth mother. There's nothing to save. Um, now, talk a little bit about, um, let me phrase this correctly, like what gets carried forth? So like what like if if you if you don't have this, what's missing? And if you do do this, what gets carried forth into the next generations? So I read a great study a few years ago about um, a premarital counseling program that asked you to bring your history, your family histories, and decide this is what I want to bring forward. This is what I want to leave behind. And I feel strongly that our history can reveal things to us that will help us make decisions going forward. Every family has troubles, has tragedies, has difficulties, and every family equally has endurance and resilience and the power to get through what they've gone through. And I think that can be an amazing testament to the strength of hum you know, humanity. <clears throat> but there, I mean, for every story that you feel like, oh, I don't wanna know that, there's the like, well, this is how they did it, you know? Infant mortality, being laid off, suicides, bankruptcies, whatever the thing is, it's not the Waltons all the time, right? Yeah. It's real life. And I think looking back to think, oh, those were the days can do us more harm than good, frankly. Yeah. That's it's just always policy. been complicated. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and human nature doesn't change. Yeah. Well, so we're still having we'll, the we'll same. We'll hope that it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, we're still having the same issues. They just look different and we have different solutions. And like one, one of the experiences I've had along these lines is I was diagnosed with AFib four years ago and um, my younger brother had AFib. He passed away about six years ago from, um, um, he had um, he had AFib, several things, but um, he had a stroke and he passed away when he was 49 years old. And my older brother was just diagnosed a couple of months ago. So this got me thinking because the doctors all said that it's not hereditary. It runs in families, but it's not hereditary. So this was like a little light bulb for me because I said oh, if it runs in families, it's being triggered by something. So this is a childhood trauma thing. We were all like, we did not, we would not love children. <laughs> so we, we were not really wanted. So this, the, to me, this is the common thread. We were not properly loved. So we had broken hearts from the time we were basically born. And um, 
and but what is it that they call it? We were we were parentified, where we had to we all had to mm -hmm. grow up too young. We had that, and this is the common thread. And the doctors will not admit that childhood trauma is something that causes AFib, other than a small group. Um, that are researching this outside of Boston, and they will actually go to a family reunion if more than five people in the family have AFib with an EKG machine and start taking EKGs. So I reached out to them. I'm hoping I hear back from them that we've got three people, but I don't know, we might not have enough. But um, but yeah, I mean, and this is, I became a, a patient advocate for AFib because of this, because nobody's talking about this and I'm going to be talking about it. So this is fascinating because it makes me realize, and I feel like I'm having this new thought, you know, there is no genealogy machine avenue for tracking trauma. That's really got to come from us. Yes. It's really got to come from us. And it's not a bad thing. You know, our families have always had trauma. It's just that we are now ready as a species to look at it and try to understand it and see what it's doing. Yeah, yeah that's that's yeah, an amazing I mean, story. My grandparents came, you know, from um, the Ukraine, from Sicily, and from Hungary. And my grandfather came from Hungary as a stowaway when he was 12 with Steve Lawrence's father. And, um, you know, it was put on him to bring the rest of the family over. He was the youngest of seven children. <sighs> So, you right. know, back then, the youngest was the most disposable. And that's so looking back on, and you know, there are all kinds of TV shows that trace our paths, and it's so romantic and exciting. But framing it in this like history of trauma kind of vision, Donna, yeah. I feel like really gives us a whole different avenue of why family history is important. And, you know, my focus is primarily on women mm -hmm. and their traumas have been really unspoken, undocumented, unspeakable even. Yes. And so we talked a little recently about a talk that I gave where somebody in the audience raised her hand and said, you know, my grandmother's death certificate was in, I think she found it in a safe deposit pot box in the bank. And on the front of the death certificate, it said she died of natural causes. And then on the back, somebody had, her daughter had written that she died from a botched back alley abortion. I know that's a hot topic right now and I don't wanna, you know, get everybody all stirred up, but I feel like we need to know the facts. We do and we, do, and we don't need to go back there, you know? Like, let's move forward. There should never be another botched back alley abortion. Well, and I feel like we talk about it like, oh, that was the 60s and the 50s. But it has a long history. You know, yes. I've worked with families from other countries that have also suffered that um, trauma. And I, and I I think this is a way forward. I don't want to get stuck in the trauma part. This is the uncovering and the understanding and the dealing with what's come before. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I just want to stay on this for a little bit longer because you had shared some other stories with me and they were all related to medical, um, uh. like a medical impact, right? So this is where like, knowing your story and knowing the medical story of your family is so important. Um, so can you share a little bit of what, of the stories that you shared with me and, and you know, how, how it's worked through families that you've worked with? Yeah. So HIPAA is another reason that it's hard to keep the history. Right. And I remember when HIPAA was passed, which is the portability and privacy act of your health information, um, you know, I had a friend in grad school who was doing the history of lobotomies and like overnight her research was shut off from her because of the privacy laws. And so what happens then is just like the um, coroner had written natural causes on the front, there's a way that we cannot go back and research that or fact, fact check that. 
And I'm not saying that hip is bad or wrong. I'm saying here's a conundrum that mm -hmm. we need to figure out how to solve. And so I also have worked with, uh, I've spoken with somebody whose relative had several back alley procedures and then came to this country and was diagnosed with a mental illness. But I think we can all agree it's trauma, right? That she wasn't allowed to have the children that she wanted. She wasn't allowed to have health care to help her get through that in a healthy and safe way. And the damage to the body and the psyche came down through the generations. And that's yeah. part of the, you know, transgenerational trauma is kind of a hot topic right now. But we have to figure out a way to make um, medical documentation possible in families. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that we were talking about in the term that you used was um, um, <clears throat> family fairy tales. Right. Right. And so we, we, we talked about um, making the leap from having a family fairy tale to having a family documentary. So can you like explain like both sides mm -hmm. of that equation? Yeah, I can. And again, I'm gonna um, call in the Waltons to serve as my uh, <laughs> stand in for the fairy tale <laughs> or any of those you know shows from the 60s and 70s, the sitcoms where everything got wrapped up in a half hour. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it it makes us feel less than, right? Yeah. Say, well, my family's not like the Huxtables. You don't have to be the Huxtables or June and Ward Cleaver to save an archive. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with some families remembering some kind of rough characters. Uh, one was, you know, he had families all around the country. <laughs> that still needs to be documented. And that family has particular shape based on that experience, mm -hmm. right? And so to be able to speak the truth in paper can be scary, but you know what? The archive will keep it private for you. And this is a key factor in moving from family fairy tale to moving to a real documentary mm -hmm. is you don't have to tell it, right? but your materials need to be there. And when I worked in archives, we had a huge collection with a lot of people in it. And the person that donated it said, I want this closed until everybody has passed on. And every couple of years, we'd pull out the you know list of everybody in it and we'd check to see who had died. And you know, that's, that's part of the safety of the archive though, is to go along with the donor's wishes. Wait till I'm gone, yeah. wait till 50 years after I've gone. It's open and public now. Whatever you want, the archivist should be able to do it. So I feel like I might have, did I answer your question the way you thought I was going um, to? Uh, um, yes and no. I mean, I think <laughs> that, um, I think you can tell them a little bit more about like, if you're looking at your family history through, um, honest from an honest perspective mm -hmm. like what is the benefit of that what how does that benefit you know your your current uh community and the community in the future so it stops the fairy tale in its tracks right and so you know the my sainted mother that kind of narrative a lot of <laughs> i feel like there are a yeah. lot of Irish families, for some reason, come to well, mind. As soon as, as soon as somebody dies, like anything they ever did that was bad just falls away and they're put on a pedestal. And um, yeah. yeah, and they don't really deserve to be there. <laughs> well, and we all want that, right? But that's not real or true. Yeah. And what happens then, too, is something comes out later and, you know, you're crestfallen and, oh, the, uh, the icon has, you know, fallen off the pedestal. Mm -hmm. But also the reverse can happen, Donna. And so, you know, there was 
one family member that served in World War I with a machine gun, lugging it around all over the place. Well, when you come back from that, what are you going to do but drink, right? <laughs> and so that guy's daughter talked about living in a little town where everybody knew your dad. It was embarrassing. They were ashamed. Well, 50 years later, we have the term PTSD to explain why that happened. And so, sure, people can be idolized. People can be, you know, crapped upon or whatever. But neither one is the full story. And I think going back to understand it in a context where you're trauma focused or you're, you know, you've got a narrative uh, going forward that you say, I want to bring this forward. I want to leave this behind. I think it's really healthy to know the truth. Yeah, it is. And um, it's also very healing for the next generation to know, oh. you know, you know, what, what, where do I come from? What happened? I mean, like people that are adopted that don't, understand where their roots are there's always like that piece missing so like if you can provide this i mean it, it could be difficult to do that in a in a family with adopted children but i mean if you have um you know children of origin like having that information is like a little morse code of who you are and, yeah. and what makes you and that that helps you understand things that are happening with inside yourself um, I know with raising my son, I've always been very honest and shared what I knew. And um, most of it is not pretty, <laughs> but he knew what he was dealing with. And now he's 20 mm -hmm. years old. and He has a self-awareness that uh, most 20 year olds don't have because he understands like, you know, he comes from foibles. <laughs> we all do yeah. if we know the yeah. truth. Right. Yeah. And so in a way, it kind of defangs or declaws those foibles to be like, well, you know, if you really have come from June and Ward Cleaver, something's terribly wrong. Right. Like that is the fairy tale. So yeah. that really isn't the truth. No. So how does how did that work for him? And you tell me and I'll tell you my about my kids. Okay. Um, what do you what in what? in what context so knowing the truth like how'd that work out for your um, son? he he's re he's just aware of who he is you know mm -hmm. he's not trying to be somebody else um he um really has a very well defined no bullshit button for a 20 year old male and um you know he he very rarely puts himself into situations that will make him unhappy that's wonderful. What yeah. a great skill. Yeah. Yeah. From your family um, history. From my family history. And and I, you know, nothing's perfect, but I really do feel like we broke trauma patterns. Um, because there was so much between my family and his dad's family. So much dysfunction. I mean, I when I, I must have been about 15 years old and I found a card that said, um, let's put the fun back in dysfunction. I bought the box. <laughs> Do you still have any left? No, I gave them out to anybody. <laughs> you <laughs> mailed them all away. I was handing them out in the street. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was a very hard upbringing. And I, you know, I, I believe that you either do what you know or you do the complete opposite. There really is in any middle ground. So I went opposite. And, you know, when I was raising my son, what, you know, if I, I'm a single parent, so I was doing much of this alone. And, um, you know, the question to myself was always, well, what would my mother do? And then I would just do total opposite. And that was my parenting method for the most part. <laughs> right. Right. So you had all the knowledge to be able to make the decision you wanted to make, not just flailing around trying to figure it out. Like you knowing that and, you know, living through it, you were like, okay, I'm going to bring this forward. I'm going to leave that behind. Yes. And I think that's the thing about knowledge, right? Knowledge is power. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's the power to decide. 
It's a barometer. It's a very powerful barometer. Definitely. Because you get to, it's, it's a, you get to you you get to measure it, and when you're measuring against fantasy, what you're going to come out with is not reality. Right. I'm going to listen to the replay and write that down. <laughs> Um, so, um, you, we, we talked about so many great things. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned was that women are often a stumbling block. Can you explain? Oh Lord. That? Yes. <laughs> I love women and I have, you know, I've been studying them since I was an undergrad and blah, blah, blah. But my biggest shock going into business for myself is how often women are the impediment to their own history. And so, for example, I went to a big, big women's expo in New Jersey a few years ago, and there were thousands of women there, and I bet I spoke with hundreds of them. And they were just like, oh, I love what you're doing. Oh, this is so great, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd say, you know, what about you? One woman in particular, she came through and she said, oh, this is so great. You know, I'm the first woman in my position as the county defender, prosecutor, I'm not sure at this point. And I said, oh, great. Let's talk about, you know, saving your history. And she said, wait, no, not me. I love what you're doing, but not me. And it's hard to get women to feel worthy enough. You know, when I was working at the university, I worked in a repository of alternate resort, which means if you're teaching at Cornell, they want your papers. You're probably contractually obligated for them to have your papers related to your work there. So if some I worked in a botany library, if a botanist had a project that didn't fit into the parameters of their university, they'd bring it to us. And we'd always make space. So Ron came, Alan came, Rogers came. It was all men. In 18 years, I had one woman come and bring me a box of stuff. Wow. And it was the documentation around her sexual discrimination suit against her boss, and she just didn't think they would keep it. Wow. And that's hegemony or you know that's dominant culture that's patriarchy that's how we're trained to think that's parenting that's it's all the stuff right it all comes together to say this is how we've always done it and one of the one of the things that um prompted me to create this whole real 50 over 50 was reading cassandra speaks by elizabeth lesser which is all about how women's voices were suppressed and when women tell the story the story changes and i th through i listened to the book and throughout listening to this book i thought of you angela and i thought of the oh. work that you are doing and how important it is and how important it is to spread the word that we really need to share what our stories are the good the bad and the ugly <laughs> and permanently share so i think yeah. remember rap groups in the 70s or whatever where women would get together and talk wonderful fabulous empowering nurturing that's how i want to spend my free time but that's still not an archive yeah and so um the only way to have women included in history is to have women included in archives and it doesn't have to be a story about you donna or about me I went to a conference on archives at Women and Archives several years ago, and one of the archivists told a story about a researcher coming in and saying, and I think she was at the Sophia Smith collection. So this researcher came in and said, I want diaries of teenage girls from the 30s and 40s who had braces. And wow. they were like, we don't keep track of that. You see, so, there you go. <laughs> for the next two or three years, she started watching for that. But your information can be helpful about the story about the Underground Railroad or about how women in rural Maine differ from women in urban, whatever, Boston. I mean, the story doesn't have to be about you. It can be the way we all endured the pandemic. Yes. Yeah. The way, you know, 
my latest thing is it's for me and you women in business the great resignation the pandemic before that you know i've been uh in business for seven or eight years but it just looks like i left corporate or ac academia i need to keep an archive mm -hmm. because if we don't keep the records of where we went it won't get written about no. but they'll guess where we went huh, they must have all gotten married and gone home <laughs> So can you give a couple of tips or strategies on how people can like simply get started doing something? Yes. Whether it's digital or paper, the first step is to decide. I have a digital and a paper collection going. And the paper stuff's more like my family things because it's older. And I have a little pile on my bureau we just moved. So as I unpack and I find things, I think, oh, I'm going to put that in the archive. And I have a folder on my desktop. Mm -hmm. And I just slide things in there. Truth be told, I have two folders inside of that that say family and professional. Mm -hmm. If I have five minutes to open it up and slide it to the right place, I do. If not, I just slide it and drop it into that folder and I'll sort it out later. Just start. And do you, who do you share it with? Um, so right now I'm looking for a place for my family collection, which I think will be the state archive. Mm -hmm. My professional collection, geez, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a place for that yet. Hmm. But I'm thinking one of my alma maters might be the right place. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something like the Small Business Bureau would be interested in or some other type of business organization. Mm -hmm. This makes me realize, too, the other thing about starting your archive now, like as you and I are talking in this exact moment, I'm thinking, well, I don't have to share it with anybody right now, Donna, but I do. So once you make that relationship, I worked with a family who had a hundred years of Jewish immigration history, 6,500 family photos. And their collection is going to YIVO in New York City. Mm -hmm. And now that that relationship is established, all the cousins, all the aunts and uncles, as they find stuff, they can put it in the family collection in the central location. Mm -hmm. So actually making that connection to an archive or a historical society or a library in the beginning can help you just have a place yeah. and keep giving it to them. Well, and it doesn't even need to be family. I mean, you could extend that out to Definitely, all right. different groups. I mean, like something like that, you can go to synagogues mm -hmm. or you can go to Jewish organizations and let them know that this exists and you can find, I mean, you know, just for that one example, you could find families that were, um, you know, taken apart through the Holocaust you know, that where, where, where contact was lost or, you know, the, there's just so many things. It's just, it's incredible. All right. So we are, we are um, no. at an hour. Okay. I'm sorry. Say what you're going to say. No, I'm not ready to be done. How long are we going? <laughs> we're, we're done. Oh, no. <laughs> They're only supposed to be a half an hour. Do you, if, I'm never I, done. Uh, I know you're never done. Um, but I, I have one, one question for you. If people come away from this interview, with or learning about you or talking from uh, talking to you about this topic that you're so passionate about what is the one thing you want them to know your story matters your story matters the big family collection i just told you about um, the girls went to a jewish athletic camp in the 30s that there's no other historical information about that i could find Remember the Dirty Dancing uh, mm -hmm. set? So that family that I was talking about stayed at the Cats Bungalows in Beacon, New York. Mm -hmm. It's like the working or lower middle class version, but it was still a safe place. It was, you know, ethnically coherent, but there's no other information about that. Our American history depends on you. Wow. Not a, not, not, not a little pressure there. <laughs> Okay, so um, Angela could be found on our 
website, therealfiftyover50.com, and you can read about her there and have links to all of her social and her website, but also share your website or how people can get in touch with you because you have so much more to say about this. Um, I do have so much more to say. I'm at AngelaLTodd.com. Apparently there are a bunch of us out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm on Instagram in the same and Facebook at the same and LinkedIn, but I'm a little I'm a little lacking on LinkedIn. I gotta give it more attention. Well, thank you for sharing your story and thank you for being part of this. And um, as this whole community grows, we'll be doing other things and you'll get to know Angela Moore and all of the other women more. We have over a hundred women that have signed up to do this. And I am being introduced to about four or five people a day. Donna, thank you for doing this. Without this makes trying. my heart sing. <laughs> I know it does. So you know what? We'll have to figure out a way that we can um, create some of some archive around what we're doing. Yes, so, I stay, love that. Yeah, I stay, love that. Stay tuned. Some good stuff coming. Well, thank you, Angela. And I am going to. We're going to go offline now. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>